<clears throat> so we're a little bit late here. Uh, sorry about that. We're running a little bit behind with our patients. Uh, so I want to go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and, and see if we can get this ball rolling. But um, uh, we're here. We're going to talk a little bit about dry needling for, for headaches. Uh, we're going to go through quite a few things there. But let me go ahead and share my screen um, and see what we can do here. All right, bear with me. Make sure I don't have any technical issues. All right, and I've got a moderator on the other end. Uh, hopefully everything is coming through uh, right now. Um, so let, let, let's go ahead and get started here. Um, my name is Luke Haynes. I'm a physical therapist. Um, um, I have developed what I'm calling the Haynes Method of Neuromuscular Dry Needling, and this is something we offer through uh, the Haynes PT Institute. We'll talk a little bit more in a little bit about uh, what our certification process looks like um, uh, and some of the advances and changes that we're making to that uh, as a result of uh, the COVID-19 situation. Uh, but we'll, we'll talk about that momentarily. But uh, th this webinar is about dry needling uh, for headaches. Definitely, uh, you're not going to get enough out of this to be proficient with the techniques that we're going to talk about. But um, I do want to demonstrate to you what, what's part of the curriculum that I teach, which is developed through um, clinical application. Um, uh, I have uh, been dry needling for about seven years now. Uh, I carry two separate certifications in addition to the one uh, through um, Haynes PT Institute. Um, and I have, in, in my course of dry needling, uh, have probably seen um, 40,000 different patient encounters uh, for dry needling uh, through that process, um, probably at around 200, 250,000 uh, 250, different needle uh, insertions. And so everything that I've taught, a lot of it is research-based, but a lot of it is, is clinical application uh, just from what I've seen and what I've seen that it works and what doesn't work. So um, that being said, uh, let's roll right in. So um, we're going to take some time today to talk about what the headache protocol is, uh, who it would be beneficial for, what diagnosis and conditions it would apply to, and how and why uh, the protocol was developed. Uh, we'll take a look at some three-dimensional anatomy to determine exactly uh, where the, uh, the, the headache protocol is applied uh, to those specific structures. I'll, I'll have a model uh, in here briefly, uh, and we will go through each of the three different uh, uh, headache uh, uh, protocols. Um, we'll briefly talk about the precautions associated with dry needling, um, and then we'll review uh, any relevant surface anatomy in, in that process, um, and then look at the actual dry needling procedure for headaches. During this webinar, if you have any questions, you can enter them in the Q&A section uh, on the bottom of your screen. Um, again, moderator will keep an eye on those, and I'll try to address as many of those uh, questions as time allows. I'll probably wait till the end of the, the webinar to do that. Um, and at the conclusion of this webinar, for everybody that's been online, I will make this available um, uh, probably within 24 hours after we conclude this. Uh, it will be available, uh, and you'll have a link through your email. So <clears throat> patient conditions that would benefit uh, from this protocol. Um, dealing with headaches, I mean, honestly, we're looking at either primary or secondary type headaches. Uh, the majority of what we see are your tension or migraine headaches. Um, under the primary heading, there's also a cluster headache. Um, the secondary headaches can cover a lot of different things, allergy or sinus headaches, uh, hormone, caffeine, uh, exertion headaches, uh, hypertension, uh, rebound or post-traumatic headaches. Again, the majority of what, what we see as far as volume of, of patients uh, tends to fall into the tension uh, headache uh, and then some more that fall into the migraine. And I have found that dry needling is a very effective treatment tool uh, for both of those. Uh, again, tension or migraine is typically what we'll see. Uh, primary goal treatment is to reduce the muscular tension to decrease the radiating pain symptoms. Uh, there are some instances where we'll use uh, tissue mobilization with the needle to release uh, the impinged nerves, uh, which can be a direct cause of the headache. Uh, we frequently use manual therapies to make an impact on a patient's headache. And as a neuromuscular approach, we can have the same type of impact uh, by utilizing dry needling to create that same outcome. Um, I've re reviewed many research studies that claim varying results with the use of dry needling for headache. 
In some cases, the authors will describe the actual dry needling protocol uh, by needle placement. And, and in more cases than not, they don't describe that. Um, and I developed the, the dry needling protocols for the headache based on the location of the headache complaint, either posterior, lateral, or anterior. So the structures to be dry needled in, in all three of these approaches, um, one, the, the upper traps uh, are a significant uh, factor. Um, I've got listed on number two, a cervical C1, C2. Now that's not referring to, to the, sec, the first and second uh, vertebra. Uh, coming from our first, our foundations course, uh, there is a, a two points that I use to uh, to needle all of the erector spiny group uh, in the cervical spine. And so that cervical C1 and C2 represents those two needle locations. And we'll cover those uh, momentarily. Uh, semispinalis capitis for a tension headache is one of the key muscles that uh, you can provide. You can find significant, almost instant relief from those headaches. Um, so that's a key. Uh, muscle there, the occipitalis, the temporalis, uh, the masseter, superficial and deep. Um, uh, the suboccipitals, we'll go into to detail on those. I only uh, teach and typically I only practice dry needling three of those. Uh, the, the fourth one, uh, I don't feel like the risk is worth uh, the effort to get to it. Um, however, uh, it, it can be needled if you don't get results. Uh, the, the SCM, uh, middle and posterior scalenes, uh, and then from a perineural standpoint, we're going to look at the greater occipital nerve, the lesser occipital nerve, and then the great auricular nerve. Uh, discussing just general precautions, um, one of the big ones is just non-consent from the patient. Um, if you have to uh, talk to a patient and, and encourage them, and, and it's a repeated effort to try to get them to buy into dry needling, odds are the outcomes aren't going to be that great. So uh, if there's resistance or hesitance, uh, then I usually won't dry needling. But definitely if there's non-consent, obviously you don't do that. Uh, so there's some question about the first trimester of pregnancy. Um, from a medical legal standpoint, it's a good uh, rule of thumb to avoid that first trimester simply because that is the, the, the time frame when the majority of, of uh, problems with uh, pregnancy will occur. So I typically stay away from that. Uh, that being said, I, I have needled during the uh, first trimester um, and, and all through uh, pregnancy. Um, uh, relative contraindications, post-surgical, uh, general consensus, uh, six weeks, um, avoid dry needling with communicating tissue, and then 12 weeks uh, in, in the local area of, um, of surgical intervention, um, unless uh, the surgeon themselves selves, uh, indicate that it, it's appropriate. Um, precautions, again, needle aversion or a phobia. Um, one of the big thing that we're not talking about, that I don't see on here is, um, okay, a little bit later, uh, the, the, the pneumothorax. Obviously, uh, in and around the rib cage uh, can be dry needle. It definitely needs to be done uh, with uh, some experience and with some, some advanced training um, <clears throat> so that we don't uh, uh, cause any issue with, with our number one big issue, and that is uh, that pneumothorax. Um, additionally, um, uh, areas of a breast implant, you want to be cautious of that. Um, there may be uh, some times you have to have the patient help move that uh, tissue out of the way. And then in the spine itself, if there's a, if it's post-surgical, if there's a laminectomy, scoliosis or severe osteoporosis, obviously that would change the orientation of the landmarks that we're using as backdrops. And so it um, doesn't mean you can't do it. You just have to be cautious of where those structures are in relation to your needle application. On perineural dry needling, uh, it's becoming more prevalent uh, when treating conditions in the extremities that include impingement of nerves, such as carpal, cubital tunnel syndrome, among others. Um, in, in our courses that we teach, uh, there are a significant number of perineural protocols that, that we uh, implement to try to impact some change in uh, some altered sensation or some pain distribution. Um, the head also presents with some entrapment syndromes that provide an opportunity to utilize dry needling as a management tool either prior to or in place of traditional nerve blocks. And so uh, we use the needle in a specific way uh, to see if we can't release that, that impinged nerve structure uh, as it travels through uh, that tissue that is causing the impingement. Um, peripheral mechanism centered around uh, decreasing the localized inflammation in the tissue that's causing the impingement, but there's also a central desensitization that occurs, an interruption of the sensory afferents and the nociceptors that are signaling the pain response. 
Um, there is a sparsity of evidence out there concerning the mechanisms of perineural dry needling. Uh, definitely more research needs to be done. Anecdotally, I can tell you that, that we are seeing good results. And on to surface anatomy. So with dealing with headaches, um, anytime we're dealing with the, head, the, the, the neck and the, and the, and the cranium, uh, several things we want to look at, just relatively speaking, uh, on the, uh, in the cervical spine, uh, the hyoid bone lines up uh, approximately with C3, uh, the thyroid venosh with C4, uh, thyroid cartilage with C5, and then the cricoid cartilage with C6. The majority of what we're going to do today has more to do with um, in, in this second uh, picture that you see on, on your right side of your screen with the mastoid process with the uh, transverse process of C1 and then the articular pillar um, down um, C2 through uh, C7. Of uh, particular interest, so you, you definitely see the spinous processes. Um, uh, two through, well here it's indicated two through one. Um, can't palpate. Uh, C1, obviously, uh, but again, to the lateral aspect, the transverse process. Um, we definitely are going to want to be able to palpate uh, the external occipital protuberance, uh, which is indicated in the upper aspect of, this, of the diagram, uh, and the, the lines coming across, which are the superior nuchal line, and below that, which I don't have marked, uh, the inferior nuchal line. Uh, so those are some landmarks that we will either palpate or we will target uh, for with, with our needles. So the, the headaches, the primary and secondary. Uh, let's talk first about our posterior uh, headaches. Uh, in this case, our patient is gonna be in the prone position. Uh, we're gonna target the cervical stabilizers and the movers. Our, our primary uh, locations are our upper traps, our levator scap, uh, those those C1, C2 from, the, from our foundations course locations and the semispinalis capitis. Our secondary locations are gonna be the greater occipital nerve and the occipitalis, and then tertiary uh, location is gonna be the suboccipitals. And so when I talk about uh, primary, secondary, and tertiary, I, I definitely don't start treatment with a patient by treating uh, all three uh, lo uh, treatment locations. Um, I normally will always start with my primary. Uh, so in this, this case, upper traps, levator, um, the C1, C2, and uh, semispinalis capitis. And, and normally that's gonna get what I'm looking for as far as pain relief. Uh, next visit, patient comes in. If I haven't noticed a significant change in their symptoms, then I'm gonna add that next layer in. I'm gonna throw the greater occipital nerve in and I'm gonna throw the occipitalis in. Uh, if they return following time, then I'll probably throw in that tertiary. So it's a layered approach to, to treatment. Uh, a, a person that comes in, uh, last thing I want to do is, is hit them with uh, 22 needles at one time, uh, especially when my, my primary location is normally where I'm going to see uh, my biggest um, change in their symptoms. Um, obviously, all of this is dependent upon your physical examination, uh, your neurological screen, uh, and your, 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 your gross assessment of the patient. Uh, but, but this is, in, in my practice, has been uh, the, the key way to go after that, is hitting those primary locations first and then targeting that on a layered approach. On the electrical stimulation, I have found that electrical stimulation says 20 minutes. Research supports 20 minutes. Um, I found that anywhere from 10 to 20 is an adequate amount of time depending on their tolerance. Uh, I like to use a burst frequency from uh, three hertz, two to three hertz up to 75 to 100 uh, hertz. Again, just depending upon um, their tolerance to stem in those needles. I will use uh, a multi-channel um, stem unit uh, to, to, to deliver that, that stem. Uh, if they're contraindicated to electrical stem, our standard um, e-stem contraindications, then, then I'll, I'll leave that off and we can do some, some uh, needle manipulation to, to get a little bit more of a, a response. Uh, but 95% um, of people that, that, that I treat will receive some sort of electrical stimulation to that, um, that needle, needling configuration. And so, We'll move on to, to, to a graphic uh, presentation here. So that primary level uh, is the upper traps, levator scap, that C1, C2, and the semispinalis capitis. And so those are, are fairly easy to get to, uh, prone position. Um, 
It could be done in a seated, seated position, but it's easier to get them to relax to do that. And so uh, the second piece, the second secondary uh, up, uh, greater occipital nerve, uh, occipitalis, and then finally we'll drop down and catch the suboccipitals. And so once we go through these, we will come back and, and do, a, do a demo of, of these needling um, placements. And so that's what the posterior aspect, and the majority of times I see that provides a significant amount of improvement. Definitely requires a home exercise program to deal with this. Most of our headache uh, patients are also gonna be presenting with some sort of a posture uh, issue, some sort of a, a, an asymmetry or dysfunction uh, that we're gonna have to deal with traditional therapy. Um, but some good responses on the posterior aspect there. So upper trap, um, we're just gonna look at, at mid belly. And again, this is all gonna be available to you um, whenever the video comes out so that you can watch, uh, I mean, read uh, the exact placements and, and so forth, needle length, uh, backdrop and precautions. Uh, but the, the upper trap, um, again, really, really powerful uh, needling location. Um, they're just mid, um, mid upper muscle. Uh, levator scap, I'm gonna, uh, gonna just pinch that superior border of the scapula and I'm gonna needle from inferior medial to superior lateral, uh, staying away from the rib cage. Um, so here's the C1 and C2 spot. Um, obviously, so here we're gonna catch splenius capitis, spinalis cervicis, semispinalis capitis, semispinalis cervicis, and the multivitis with, with one needle location uh, approximately at C6. Um, the, 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 the last splenius cervicis kind of skips that area, so we drop way down, uh, down to the spinous process of T4 uh, to actually get that last piece of, um, of the rectus spiny that's coming up there. So two, two, two really good spots to catch all of that cervical rectus spiny group. And then the semispinalis capitis, again, I find that this is a significant location of, of muscular stress and tension uh, for people that are dealing with headaches. Uh, really good response out of, of needling that. I'm just gonna locate that tender aspect and needle uh, superiorly uh, toward the cranium. Uh, and then the greater occipital nerve. Um, so there are two places, and the next slide is the occipitalis itself. So the upper red dot that you see on that primary location is the location for, um, actually it could be a little bit more lateral actually, uh, but you'll catch the occipitalis there. And then the, the greater occipital nerve is gonna uh, move through that fascial plane um, where that second dot is located. And we can do a tangential uh, needle application into that and then uh, manipulate that needle to see if we can uh, improve some um, space for that nerve to come through that, that fascial plane. And so that's uh, what we'll look at there. The perineural protocols have their own primary, secondary, uh, and in some cases tertiary and some segmental uh, needling locations. In, in this case, for, for purposes of uh, this webinar, I'm really just focusing on, on where those nerves break through the fascial plane. And then occipitalis, uh, we're just going to be over uh, three or four finger breaths and then uh, superior three or four. And we'll just take a really oblique angle into that muscle as well. The suboccipitals, um, I, I traditionally will only needle three of these. Again, uh, the third, the fourth one can be needled, but it's, it's proximity to the frame and magnum. Um, I try to minimize risk as much as possible, and that's one I feel like I can stay away from and, and usually still have really good uh, outcomes. Uh, but the obliquus capitis inferior, um, and we'll go over this, uh, there's really nice landmarks to palpate and locate that. Uh, needle insertion, um, we move on to the, the OQ superior. Um, likewise, we're using the mastoid process and the uh, external occipital protuberance uh, to locate our needling location for that. And then the rectus capitis posterior major. Um, again, coming off of a spinous process of C2, uh, finger breath lateral, and will direct towards the inferior nuchal line uh, for that needle placement. So let's move on to the lateral. Uh, headache, you know, a person that's got that, that headache out there on, on the side, uh, probably not quite as common as the, as the posterior, but uh, we still have people that present with this. And there are times that a person will present with both some posterior and some lateral. And so there's a mixture of these two 
uh, protocols and approaches that can handle that. As you'll see, some of these uh, needling locations are, are very similar. There's some carryover from one to the other on posterior to lateral. And so, again, our, our primary locations, again, very similar. Upper traps, levator scap, semispinalis capitis. Biggest difference here, we're going to add in the temporalis. Secondary location, we're going to throw in the superficial and deep masseter, uh, the, the SEM, and then the middle and posterior scalings. On the middle and posterior scaling needle, we'll actually catch uh, quite a few other things while we're, we're needling that, given how I've created that, that needle placement. Uh, and then tertiary, uh, we'll look at the lesser occipital nerve, and then the great auricular nerve. Again, I will uh, apply some, some electrical stem to here. On the lateral aspect, especially in regards to the uh, middle and posterior scalings, if I'm uncomfortable with the patient's ability to remain stationary, uh, then I may just do some, some, some short uh, stimulation with me just right there. Uh, I may not leave that for a, a 10, 15, 20 minute duration. Uh, the scalings are a really good a location to get some good response out of a patient as far as their pain uh, situation. However, uh, there's also a lot of vasculature and, and uh, brachial plexus issues that I don't want them moving their head and, and doing a lot of other uh, issues that could create some issues. So I have to assess the patient's compliance with being stationary uh, prior to, to dealing with, with whether we're going to leave some stem on or not. So again, uh, just from a picture standpoint, we're still gonna catch the upper traps, levator, um, the semispinalis capitis, and then the temporalis on, on the lateral aspect. Here they'll be in the, the sideline position. Uh, then uh, we'll catch uh, the masseter. Uh, we'll, we'll catch both superficial and the deep. Um, we'll catch the SCM and then the scalenes. And then we'll go after the, the lesser uh, occipital and the great auricular nerve, again, where those nerves can come become impinged um, or entrapped as they're traveling through that fascial plane, uh, that can be one of the issues where people uh, start to see some of that lateral headache piece. Uh, a lot of folks get uh, you know, nerve blocks in that area to really try to improve that. So uh, dry needling can definitely play a role. I do have patients that I treat with that condition and we, we, we get some good results from that. Again, the upper trapezius we've looked at, uh, the levator, uh, semispinalis capitis, um, and then temporalis, uh, big broad muscle. Um, I like to catch it um, a finger breadth um, superior and and posterior um, to to the angle uh, of the zygomatic bone, uh, the temporal border, or the angle of the zygomatic bone. Um, that's a, that can get a really good um, release there. Uh, interestingly. The reason I include temporalis and the masseter is that's also one of the key issues that I use for dry needling for a person with a TMJ uh, type uh, problems. They're a clincher. If they're a clincher, they're definitely going to be having some lateral pain. And so that gets included as the treatment approach as well in dealing with uh, that, that aspect. Again, so superficial uh, masseter on the um, angle of the mandible. Um, more distally, and then the deep masseter uh, is a little bit more superior um, at the temporal process uh, of the zygomatic bone. Then SCM, uh, what we're gonna catch, we're gonna have them rotate away, we're gonna pull SCM out away from uh, the neurovascular bundle and just needle across, um, kind of thread through that it's definitely not a direct approach. Um, and then here we're gonna look at, um, we're gonna get middle and posterior scalings with, uh, we're gonna throw in some longissimus services, iliocostalis services. We're also gonna catch a little levator as it's, as it's coming up there. I didn't include that there, but that's gonna be there as well. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll walk through this when we do the demo. Uh, we definitely wanna stay on the articular pillar and not anterior to that. You go anterior, then we're talking about uh, possible interference into the vertebral artery and the brachial plexus itself. So this is one that if you're not comfortable with your landmarks, if you're not positive of your identification of your structures, then you don't, you don't needle that. And some people are just really bulky and really big and, and you can't palpate it. But if you can, it's a really good uh, needling location, a good response uh, with those folks. And then the, the lesser occipital nerve, uh, the key is in between um, uh, the occipitalis and the uh, temporalis. 
um, where that nerve comes up right there. It's a nice kneeling location, more so at the posterior aspect of the mastoid, uh, where again, the nerve comes through the fascial plane. Um, that, that's a nice place where we can get that right at the inferior, uh, the superior nuchal line. Uh, so as, as you can tell, a lot of these nerves uh, have a lot in common with, with their penetration of that uh, fascial plane right there, and that's where we're gonna target them the most. Um, on the, the great auricular nerve, again, there's a spot where that nerve comes up through the fascial plane, uh, right behind the ear, and then a little bit further anterior on the mastoid process than on the other nerve. But there's also two locations, just posterior on the superior and the inferior aspect of the mandible, where they can become entrapped as well. And so moving on to the third piece, which is the anterior symptoms. Um, a lot of people can have just muscular tension in this regard. What I'm not including in here is treatment of things uh, such as a sinus type headache. There are some uh, dry needling protocols for that, but I've not included that here. Um, so here we're looking at um, uh, the frontalis, uh, the depressor supercilii, the procerus, and the temporalis. Um, with this one, you definitely want to make sure that you're evaluating uh, both your lateral structures as well and your posterior structures. Um, this is one that there, there could be some underlying uh, pathology that, that's going on that you definitely want to make sure that you're doing a, a good assessment for any other red flags um, or cautions for this one. So um, the frontalis, um, the depressor supercilii, the, the procerus and the temporalis. Uh, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't treat this one as much as I do the other uh, because there's usually other issues going on with this. However, in the case where it is an isolated frontal headache, this is a good way of releasing, remo uh, decreasing that, uh, that muscular tension. And then we'll, we'll walk through how to, to needle those. Again, we've already, already looked at how to needle the temporalis and we'll demonstrate that momentarily. Uh, frontalis, we're just gonna go above the superior orbit, um, superior margin of the orbit, about three finger breaths and, and needle um, through that on a tangential basis uh, to, the, to the skull. Um, the procerus, uh, we're just gonna pinch at that super orbital line and we're gonna needle down towards the, the nasion. Uh, similar on the depressor supercilii, and there's a corrugator that, that sits deep to that uh, <clears throat> at the superior medial orbital border. Uh, we're going to use a thumb and index finger. We're going to pinch that together and then get going to needle down towards the nasion or that, that dip uh, between uh, the orbital um, and, and the dip of, of the nose, the upper dip of the nose. So now we're going to pause momentarily while we do some technical stuff and we're going to run through a little dry needling demo of these structures. So be patient with us momentarily as I get my uh, assisting folks in here and let's see what we can do. Thank you, assisting folks. So I Yes, I think so. Okay. Better safe than sorry. Okay. Yes, for later. Okay, that way you can get So we'll start with, on the posterior aspect, upper traps, levator, uh, the C1, C2, and then semispinalis capitis. For, for speed of demo, I'm using all three centimeter needles. Uh, in the slides, I have recommendations on, on needle length. Obviously, all of those lengths always are dependent on patient habitus. But in this case, we'll start with upper trap. And I'm just going to find the midpoint between, I'm going to move that a little, and I'm just going to grasp. I'm definitely looking anteriorly for the clavicle. I want to be about a thumb breadth above that to avoid uh, the, the lung field. I'm just going to come in, placement, and needling through to there. 
On the anterior aspect, I'm, my finger is there. I'm feeling for approximation so that I know where the, the end of the needle is. So that's the upper trap. If you will go ahead and bring left by your side. For Levator, I'm going to a different side. Maybe she's got some really weird asymmetries and she's got stuff on both sides. So I'm gonna palpate for that superior border of the scapula. And we know that Levator attaches to that, so I'm just gonna bunch that together and I'm gonna needle from a, from a medial inferior to a superior lateral direction through that. Again, fingers are on the anterior aspect to identify the needle as it approximates. And so there's levator scap. We'll move on to C1 and C2, which is at the spinous process of C6 and of T4, which catches all the cervical erector spiny group. Needles are all, in, all already in place, so I can't do it at this point. However, if I was looking for C6, I would have the person extend, C6 would move anteriorly, C7 would stay stationary. So I'm gonna find C6, one of her finger breaths laterally, then inferior and medial direction down to cervical lamina. It's right there. For the rest of the group, I'm going to drop to T4. I'm going to come one finger breadth lateral. And likewise, inferior, medial, down to lamina. Right there. In this case, up oh, one more, semispinalis cavitis. So I'm going to feel for external occipital protuberance. I'm going to drop down and just beside I'm going to bracket. In that location is semispinalis capitis and most of your people with posterior cervical headache complaints are going to be right there. Odds are you're going to have to get right in the middle of all the hair. And I'm going to get the needle in and then I'm going to direct it almost at a 45 degree angle towards the cranium to right there. That is a powerful needle for reducing headaches. Okay. Remove those so that you don't have to keep them in there. You're doing a great job. All right, so we'll, we'll look next at the occipitalis and the greater occipital nerve. And if you'll bear with me patiently, let's open up some more needles. There's not a fast way to do this. So for occipitalis, again, I'm gonna find greater occipital protuberance. I want to move just about a finger breadth, um, or two or two or three finger breaths, lateral up two or three, four, just in this general area. This one is going to be an extreme oblique angle, so I'm going to drop. And in this case, I may hit back drop on the cranium, but what I'm trying to do is get through that fascial plane, and and stay in that muscle right there. So occipit uh, occipitalis. On the greater uh, occipital nerve, we're going to look at that fascial plane lateral to the greater occipital protuberance. We're just going to come about one finger breadth lateral to that, and that's the plane where the nerve comes through. And again, kind of tangential to the skull into that plane. Here, now I'm going to manipulate that tissue. I'm going to I'm going to do some unidirectional twisting. It's, we're going to grab some, some collagen. Now I can manipulate. I can continue to manipulate. I'm going to twist a little bit more. 
and it's a good mobilization of the tissue in and around where that nerve may be entrapped. Okay, then I'll unwind and remove the needle and hopefully not take the hair. And that is our posterior. Except for suboccipitals. Let's do those. You doing okay? Yes. All right. So for the, the suboccipitals, the first, I'm going to find the spinous process of C2. That's a very prominent spinous process of C2. So this is obliquus capitis inferior. I'm going to look for transverse process of C1. There's a midpoint that I'm looking for. And I'm going to needle to that. Right there. Oblique is capita superior. I'm going to find the, you don't want to lose that needle, mastoid process, greater occipital protuberance. There's a midpoint, and I'm going to go posterior to anterior to there. Then rectus capitis posterior major. Again, I don't typically needle minor. I'm going to find the spinous process of C2. And one finger breadth lateral with about a 15 degree, 20 degree superior angulation. I'm going to needle towards the inferior nuchal line. And those are the three suboccipitals that I'll needle. I will then come in and stimulate those. All right. Now we'll move over to sideline and look at the lateral. You're doing a great job. Dallas is our model today. She's a student from CPT student from Hardin Simmons University, a place that I've attended in a long distant past. Um, graciously being our model today. So on the lateral aspect, we talk about the upper traps, levator's cat, semi spinalis cavitus. We've already needled those, so I'm not going to put her through the, the torture of doing those again. But we will come now to temporalis. Needles. That shot. All right. So for temporalis, I'm going to look for the, the orbital border. You can feel for a pulse. You want to stay away from the pulse and the temporalis. I like to come in just posterior to that temporal or orbital border, I'm gonna drop in about 45 degrees and down right there, okay? We'll move on to temporalis, I'm sorry, the masseter, superficial and deep. I'm just gonna demonstrate location on these. So you're gonna find your, your border. With the needle not in there, we could have her clinch. Needle is in, she did it anyway. So superficial is gonna sit right at that inferior, posterior inferior angle. And I can needle, I can drop in right there and get that. For the, for the deep, I'm gonna come for the angle um, at the zygomatic arch. And I'm gonna drop down just about a finger breadth and I can drop that needle right there. And I can get both of the, the 
the masseters. So the masseters and the temporalis, somebody, again, a side note, somebody that's dealing with clenching, TMJ, fantastic way of dealing with those pieces. Remove that. All right. Um, the SEM in the middle and posterior scalenes. So for SEM, she's already rotated to the lateral aspect. I can see we've got some vein structure right here. I don't want to needle into that. I can catch the SEM anywhere from its sternal or clavicular head. Um, I want to look and make sure that I'm not into a venous structure. I can catch it coming right off of the mastoid process. In this case, I'm going to catch it below the vein, and I'm just going to thread through SEM. to right there. I'm always palpating anteriorly for needle placement. We don't want that to go somewhere it doesn't need to go. And then the scalings and several structures that come here. I'm gonna palpate for the articular ridge, the articular pillar. And for me, this is gonna be around four, five, uh, C4, C5 that I'm looking for. Um, if you can't identify, if you can't palpate this, then you don't need to needle it because we've got neurovascular all happening anteriorly. So I'm going to identify that border and then I'm going to do a slight posterior angulation and I am going to land on backdrop on the articular pillar. Also a very powerful spot. Definitely have to be able to needle. As you can tell, I've bisected uh, the vein with SCM and scaling, so uh, definitely need to be aware of your surface anatomy on those. Okay, let me toss these, and we'll talk about the perineural. So for the, the lesser occipital nerve, I'm gonna come from the mastoid process. I'm gonna come about three finger breadths posterior, and about one finger breadth superior to gain access to that. Again, it's gonna be an oblique angle as I'm going down that fascial plane. I'm gonna come in and then I'm gonna rotate and then manipulate that tissue can take several to many rotations before the collagen winds around that needle, but a very nice way to, to, to break up some, some tissue that's impinging and trapping that nerve. Similar, we can drop over to the great auricular nerve. Biggest aspect is gonna be where it crosses the fascial plane behind the ear, and it's less than a finger breadth posterior. So I will drop. Good for this? Mm -hmm. All right. So I can see a vein structure. I'm going to go right above it and I'm going to go underneath it. And I may have to redirect a little bit. And so then again, I will some unidirectional twisting and then I can mobilize that tissue right there. For the great auricular nerve as well, there's a spot of entrapment at the posterior angle of the draw, jaw, or the inferior, posterior, and then superior, right in front of the ear. So I'll use a shorter needle, a 1.5 centimeter needle, uh, to, to get into those areas. Um, but that is also part of the, the great auricular nerve. All right. So let me trash these and we'll go supine. Okay. Good job. I will be kind. So I'm going to use some 1.5 centimeter needles here. Super small. So the first one, 
uh, frontalis. I'm going to find the apex of the orbital margin, and I'm just going to come up uh, about three finger breadths and insert. Again, it's going to be tangential to the skull. the procerus. So I'm going to come in, I'm going to pinch and drop towards the nasion. Right there. The depressor supercilii and the corrugator are at the medial angle of the orbital ridge. I'm definitely palpating. You don't want to needle into the eyeball. So I'll needle there. Very good. And then lastly, because it's so prominent, we'll come back. We've already done it, so I'm not going to do it again, but I would catch the temporalis as well. And so those would be the four pieces of the anterior aspect. All right. Unless you want to keep those, I will retract. Go ahead. All right. You are clear. All right, give us one moment and we are gonna reprocess and do some technical things. I've got a few more things I wanna talk about. Okay, I'll get to my slideshow thing. Share, screen. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about dosage and frequency. Um, that's always a question that I get. And so most cases can be divided into five categories. Uh, dosage and frequency is definitely determined on, <clears throat> on a patient's activity level, the chronicity of the condition, the response to treatment, and probably the most important factor is compliance of a patient to a well-developed home exercise program. Whether it's a headache issue or whether any neuromuscular issue that we deal with, that, that HEP is, is keen to success. So obviously I'm a massive believer in dry needling as a treatment modality to address the first phase of healing. That being said, it is only a modality. It is not the cure and belief that it is such is false. Uh, dry needling is needed, as is any other modality, to address a neuromuscular response to a biomechanical dysfunction. That dysfunction can only be addressed through a change in the mechanical function, flexibility, and strength. That being said, when properly applied, I feel like dry needling can be the most effective tool we have in our arsenal to address that phase one of healing, which is the inflammatory response. So the five categories, uh, the athlete, uh, this, and here we're talking about a high level um, athlete person. Uh, they've got no comorbidities. The issue is new. Something that's happened just within the first 10 days. They have not had a significant deviation from strength or their performance level. Frequency of that dry needling, it's going to be one to three sessions within three to five days. This is going to be a short-term issue. Uh, prognosis is excellent and they should be able to resume to normal training within two to four days. The athlete who's had one or more co comorbidities, this, uh, the issue has moved to a subacute stage. Uh, 14 plus days. Here they have begun to, to have some asymmetries in their strength and performance. Uh, this is probably going to be three to six sessions within the first one to three weeks. Uh, prognosis is still excellent, but they'll probably need two to three weeks of training to restore their asymmetries. Then they can resume performance training. The average Joe or the weekend warrior is the next correct category. Uh, they're in decent physical shape. They've had some incident that resulted in a strain or an overuse injury, a localized muscle or a group of muscles. These folks probably will just need one to three sessions within the first three to five days. Their prognosis is excellent. They will need to ad adapt an ongoing HEP to address the mechanical deficit that set them up for the injury. So something was going on already that wasn't quite right and that activity really brought it on. So that HEP is gonna be critical for them uh, to keep this under control. The quick stick, this is our work colleague. This is somebody in the clinic or in the office, somebody who slept wrong, somebody who just wants a quick fix. Uh, we're gonna, we're, they're, gonna, they're gonna be needled one time. Uh, now the downside is their prognosis is only fair. Uh, uh, 
they'll have an underlying condition that will need compliance with an HEP to correct, but they're probably not gonna be willing to accept this fact or be willing to do the work. Uh, there's a decent chance this person will become our next person, which is the procrastinator. The procrastinator has one to three comorbidities. They've been dealing with their pain or their functional complaint for several years. They're unable or unwilling to deal with the issue due to a variety of either valid or invalid reasons. And now they've decided to do something about the problem. So they're, they're, they procrastinated, but now they're serious. They want to do something. Uh, these folks are probably going to take a good eight to 12 sessions within 30 days. They're going to need a, a full plan of care to, to, to change uh, what's going on with their pain, with their dysfunction. Uh, their prognosis is good, but success fully depends on their compliance with their HEP. Our dry needling is fully comprised of trying to get that pain, that dysfunction down to a tolerable level so that they can move on to restoration of motion and strength and then return to previous activity. So the HEP is critical for those folks. And then we finally, this, the number five is what I call the hard case. There are multiple comorbidities. Uh, they've got some severe osteoarthritis, degenerative joint disease, other issues that honestly require surgical intervention or some sort of intervention. Unfortunately, it can't be done due to either medical or personal issues, such as they can't get cleared for surgery due to pulmonary or cardiac issues. So they've got some bad stuff going on, but there's nothing medically that can be done because of uh, more serious medical concerns. It doesn't mean that we can't help them. Uh, so frequency with these folks. For the first 30 days, we're probably gonna see them uh, through dry needling eight to 12 times. Um, the second 30 days, we're probably still are gonna be, be seeing them twice a week, uh, once or twice a week for, uh, for dry needling. And then that, 30, that third month and beyond, uh, we'll still probably see them once a week, once every other week uh, for some maintenance. Um, their prognosis is fair. This is definitely, this is long-term maintenance. Um, insurance might be an issue and it re might require a cash pay situation. Um, and treatment will be required until, until interventional clearance is obtained. We're not gonna fix these people, but we can reduce their pain symptoms and we can restore some quality of their function. Uh, again, it's, this is non-pharmacological pain management, plain and simple. Uh, the dosage may have to be adjusted based on their condition. Um, treatment should improve functional outcomes, but withdrawing or discharging the service it will result in return to a prior condition. Uh, and there's only gonna be limited improvement with a progressive HEP. Again, this is maintenance. So um, I will check with my moderator in a moment to see if we've had any questions. Uh, while I'm going through this, um, I wanna let you know that, that I am doing monthly webinar posts and uh, they will be uploaded to our, our website at, www.hainesptinstitute.com. Um, and if you want a link to this webinar before I get it posted up there, just send me an email uh, to info, the info at there. Um, tomorrow about, well, within the next 24 hours, uh, you'll get a, an email um, that has a link to the, to the webinar as well. Um, and so um, it's also going to talk about uh, our, our three course certification, live certification program. But I've included a little information on, on what I'm doing with our seminar situation. Um, I've com I'm converting all of this material also into an online uh, format. Uh, it, it's, it's 11 courses. Uh, the first one is, um, again, the foundations course, uh, and the rest of it are broken down by body part. Um, now, folks that uh, have been trained through another treatment program before, uh, don't have to go through our foundations course. If you've got competency in, in needling, that's, that's fine and fantastic. Um, but you probably will get a little bit more uh, from, a, from a practical application through the other coursework. Um, so, and more information on our added online component will be forthcoming. Okay, we had two questions into the Q&A. Um, the first one is, what response are you hoping or looking for the patient to report when you do perineural dry needling? So what, what I'm looking for with perineural dry needling is if, if so let, let's talk about the posterior aspect here. What I'm hoping to see is a significant reduction in pain. So what we're trying to differentiate, is it a, a muscular pain that's radiating up there or is it a nerve entrapment pain? So my, my results and my outcome are, 
are the same. I want to see reduction in pain. Uh, some people with entrapment will, will see the pain symptoms. Some will see uh, an analgesic effect. They'll, they'll have a little bit of a loss of sensation. So I'm looking for a reduction in pain, a decrease in that, that intensity level of either pain or the, the numbness, the paresthesia. The other one was, does dry needling help with swallowing? You know, as, as far as I'm aware, I, do, I don't know of, of a whole lot of information about dry needling related to swallowing. Now, there are a lot of the muscles in, in the anterior aspect that, that do address that aspect. Um, on When I do my craniofacial uh, dry needling, uh, we, now, we, we just did uh, from, say, the, the orbit up. Um, we can do a lot of the, uh, the dry needling much lower into the digastrics and, 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 and the muscles down into the, the bottom of the mouth. Um, I, I haven't honestly had a lot of interest in, in SLPs uh, for, for that type of approach. Uh, there are some things that are definitely needleable. It is, I will say, it is, a, is an approach that requires significant skill. Um, uh, I do some um, ultrasound guided dry needling. That, that would probably, probably be an area where we would need to, to bring the, the, the ultrasound guidance in simply because of the location of, 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 of the structures in that area. Uh, we didn't go over the anterior scalenes today, but we, we can use palpation to locate some very specific structures um, and, and dry needle that. And so there are other structures in there. But if there's more information that you'd like about, about swallowing and so forth, uh, I can definitely give you some more information. On, so I've got some upcoming webinars um, e each month. Um, next month, we're gonna talk about low back pain and piriformis syndrome. Uh, the month after, tennis and golfer's elbow, uh, the IT band syndrome. We'll look at impingement or subdeltoid sub, uh, subacromial bursitis uh, in October. We'll look at plantar fasciitis in November, uh, thoracic outlet syndrome, and then December, uh, we'll look at uh, pes serine bursitis. Uh, a lot of information there. As, as I complete these, I will post them on our, on our website. Um, I've got a couple of, that I've already posted on there. One is on a, uh, a novel approach to genicular nerve dry needling. And I'm gonna be honest, I forgot what the one before that was. Um, rotator cuff. Uh, we did one on the rotator cuff, which there's some really good stuff there. So you might go online, check that out if you want to, 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 to sign up to watch these again next month. Uh, there's a place to register there. And if you want to contact me, uh, you can always email me. Um, uh, you can go to our, our Facebook page or Instagram uh, page. Uh, just, just let us know. But I hope you enjoyed the content. I hope it is applicable. I hope it's something that you can put into practice. If you have any questions about uh, needling, dry needling for headache, please feel free to reach out and let me know. Thanks a lot.